do a quick uh, bandwidth check. Test, test. Let's see, unmute. All right, cool. Uh, let's play some Winamp. this here we go let's bring up chatty and see who's here surly dev you're always here I can count on you download is looking better let's see if we can get upstream above two megabit per second hey that's not bad I mean it's still crap compared to the office but we'll take it I might even be able to crank up the, the bitrate. But hopefully we're looking good. Okay, uh, let's see what we're doing here. I'm gonna go to Git. No, that's not what I want. GitHub, our Dallas Dev Better Web. This afternoon, I've got a bug I wanna fix. It's a bug that keeps coming back. So on devbetter.com, you can say I forgot my password and it will send you your password using SendGrid or it did until I broke it because I added this local SMTP service thing nine days ago hey God's gift to earth welcome back and uh, you know this broke stuff so uh, the reason why that broke stuff is because it's running in production which it should never do because look right here in startup I tell it if the environment is development, use this thing. But otherwise, always, always use the send grid one. And it's not working. So we're going to fix that um, because I'm an idiot and I don't know how to write code. Now, the real reason this is failing, uh, let's see if we can close everything to the right. It's not really a thing with this, is it? Let's just close all but this. The real reason this is failing uh, is I'm using Autofac here as my DI container. Autofac has this wonderful feature that you can take advantage of, but can also shoot yourself in the foot it with, uh, where it will scan assemblies for interfaces and types, and it will wire them together for you so that you don't have to do all of this stuff, because this stuff gets old, right? Having to write all that uh, for every single service. All right, so if you're, if you're lazy, uh, you can do something like this, and you just say, register all the types in my assemblies as they're implemented interfaces. And this is wonderful. Uh, I use it a lot on production systems too, uh, or something similar. Structure Map has a similar feature, um, but it can it can shoot you in the foot. It can bite you, and the reason is because Autofac, which I'm less familiar with than I am with Structure Map, um, actually doesn't have a way to remove services. And so I actually opened an issue with them last week, and they were pretty quick to come back and answer. And I said, hey, apparently there's no way to unregister things in the container builder. Uh, and so after I do this, which is that code I just showed you, um, I can't remove things I don't want in a certain environment. And they said, hey, well, you could just filter them when you add them. And someone else said, hey, you're right, you can't do that. Uh, but, you know, this doesn't work like this iService collection, which would be nice if it did, right? Um, instead, you just need to avoid registering the thing in the first place. So they don't have any notion of scan all the things and then get rid of the ones you don't want. Uh, instead, you have to basically decide how you're going to pull things in based on what environment you're in. In my case, when I'm in production, uh, let's go ahead and start up. When I'm in production, I want to use my SendGrid email, which is this one. Dink. Um, but when I'm in development, I want to use local SMTP because then I can use a tool uh, that sits in my task tray, like uh, SMTP for dev, and I can test that those emails are being sent without having to actually send emails, which I really don't want to do when I'm just developing a feature. All right, so it's a pretty common issue with systems that deal with notifications and emails of having alternate implementations for those email services. 
And really the, the root of this bug is just me not working with AutoFact the way it expects to be worked with. All right, so uh, these guys were, were very helpful 10 days ago, I guess. Uh, and they, they gave me some ideas for how to do this. So you could have two different registration blocks, first register all the things except for the, uh, the ones that, that deal with the email, um, and then register those, one being for everything that's just dev and prod, and then only in prod, put in the send grid one. That might work. Uh, but Alistair was telling me about autofact modules, and I think autofact modules is what I want. So I can define a base abstract module class that does all the common stuff, but it can't do everything. It has to be restricted to only those types that really are common. So I probably would need to get rid of my magic code at that point. Um, and then I would have a different module that would do the, the stuff that was in development versus production. So I'd probably end up with three modules, a base one and then two implementations. Um, here's an example of a module. So they were suggesting that uh, you can use a predicate to define whether this or that registration should happen. Um, and so yeah, so I'm just going to try and figure this out, create a, an autofact module and not should register and, and just figure out how to do this. All right. Anybody have any questions? Don't have to be related to this. You know, how's your week going? It's going to be uh, somewhat interactive. Um, all right, so let's go in here. And the first thing we're going to do is create an autofact module. So public class default infrastructure module module. That's an autofact module, I hope. Alright, and that says uh, autofact module. Okay, and then what can I do with that? Can I override things? Happy to finally catch one of my streams. Hello, Conk, or Conc. I'll go with Conk. Um, Alright, so that is a module. It's going to take in a funk of what I should register. Hmm. This isn't a very good sample for me to work from, so I'm not sure what it's doing. Okay. So I can pass in a... F I gotcha. I know what this does. Okay. So I don't need this for my load everything thing. Con as in concert. So... Cons... Cons, maybe? I don't know. That's a C as an S sound. There you go. Alright, cons. Gotcha. Alright. Um, I think I need this load method, and I think that's all I need. So we go in here, and I don't need that. I just need to call builder and have it do things. Um, these specific types I can throw in here now, probably. Override, and then why are you red? There is no load to override. That's what the problem is. So why, why are you telling me to call this thing if that doesn't exist on this thing? Let's see, what, what can I override? Not a lot. User find modules. I was just singing the praises of the Autofact guys and how helpful they were, but they're giving me code that doesn't work. Override. Load. Override to add registrations to the container. Duplicate. Yeah, that's because of that. Alright. Okay, yeah. There it is. Cannot change when overrided. Protect. Oh, okay. Maybe that's what I don't want. can't make it public. Aha, that's the problem. He made it public, not me. Okay, but he was just writing code in GitHub, so I'll forgive him. Okay, so then I need a way to load this module. <coughs> um, or is it automatically going to be loaded? I think it might get automatically loaded. Let's pull up some docs. No, uh, there. So, autofag modules. Modules. Let's keep my chatty thing going. All right. 
Modules, components, advantages of modules, configuration, yada yada yada. Okay, here's an example. Take the container builder. Alright. And if I want to do something, do this, otherwise do that. Okay, so I could have all this be in one place with a flag for the environment, perhaps. Or uh, is production or something. Um Okay. I can register the module and pass in things here. That's a property. Put it register module. All right. Best practice to add register module. Okay. All right. Sure that's I'm not sure that's all that much different than what I'm doing here but that's fine so let's go into startup and configure container initialize let's see how do I call the module again that was builder.register no register module and then new it up okay so I think I just say here builder dot register module and I could probably say of T. Um, I'll say new default infrastructure module. Right? And now in there I could pass it a flag or give it a property of what my environment is. So why don't we do that? Uh, we'll just pass in env dot environment name to it. And then let it do whatever it's gonna do. Uh, I think. What branch am I on? Master. All right, I'll, I'll change that. All right, so I don't need that anymore. Um, and I do need a constructor though. And it's gonna just take in the string. Environment name, and I really only really care if I'm in development or production. So I can say private bool is development equals false. We'll default to production, and we'll say let's see, that should be underscore is. I guess I don't want to pass in a boolean here, but but I kind of do. Um, maybe we'll do that. That way I don't have to do parsing of environment names in this type, which really doesn't care about such things. So, we'll just do this. Is development. Alright, so now in here, instead of passing that, we'll say that. This thing used to have a dot is development, but it doesn't anymore. So I have to do this. Right? Okay, so now this will register that module and tell it whether it's in development. So that's cool. And at that point, um, we just assign that. Is development equals is development. That's easy. And then in here, uh, let's break this up into a few different things. Um, private void register common dependencies with container builder builder we'll put those in there because I always want those um, register common dependencies and then we'll say if is development register dev only dependencies else register production only dependencies dev I guess we'll make that development and generate a method and generate a method now everything looks pretty good to me 
that other code from startup that was going to add the send grid email service. That's a production only dependency. So that goes here. And then the other one was the local email. And that goes here. And we need the interfaces. And that looks good. Um, so this thing's good to go. And we're already loading it. And what we're not doing, if I get rid of all this code, is we're not scanning to register anything else. So any other services I have are not going to work. Um, but we're going to find out what those are when we run. And we'll just get rid of that magic, at least for now, and be explicit about it inside this module. So we'll build real quick. Everything should build, but at runtime we're going to fail. So let's run our tests. I'm expecting that the tests will show me some things breaking, because that's why I have them. And they all pass. Huh. Alright. Well, I guess that means my code is perfect. Let's ship it. Oh, but it was not perfect. What did we say here? Uh, AppDB context for migration, configure, web startup. Hmm. I must have commented out more code than I should have. Could not resolve AppDB context. That should still be happening in startup. I didn't get rid of that. That's okay. Alright, like here's configure services, here's have to be context, gets added, add all these other things. What else was I doing in initialize autofac, I guess? Just registration, right? But maybe, hmm. I didn't think this was what was needed for EF. I think that was just needed for my types. Exception was thrown, trying to activate adapt to be context. None of the construct, oh, I know why. I know why, okay, cool. So let's go look at AppDB context, I'll show you why. Um, over here, AppDB context actually needs this iDomain event dispatcher. And that is why it's failing, because it can't find that, because I'm not registering it. Um, it should be wired up to this domain event dispatcher. And it needs this other thingy. All right, so we go back to my module, and what does question question do? Uh, where is that? just saw that. It's not here, but basically it does a null check. Um, is it in here? I'm not sure where it was. Maybe it was here, right there. So this says assign this variable to this assembly. So get the assembly that has the type EF repository in it, um, but this will return null. Assembly.getAssembly will return null if it doesn't find the assembly that has that type. Um, and so if it's null, then what this does is it says, well, if that's null, then do this thing on the right. Otherwise, just return it. Um, and so here I could, if I wanted to, I could return back an assembly, right? This, this thing on the right is going to be assigned to this. But I can also use a, a throw statement, uh, sorry, a throw expression here um, and, and just throw the exception here in this case. Normally, uh, this would be a way to pass something or pass a default. Um, but I'm kind of, this, this is not that uncommon to use as a guard clause, essentially, uh, where if this thing happens to be null, we throw. All right, so in here, the first thing that we are blowing up on is that we don't have a type registered. I'm going to move this up to the top so I can just have common be first, and then development. I want them to be in the same order that they're in my method call. So do that. Make it all pretty. All right, now I need that domain event dispatcher. So I'll say builder, register type of I. I want the concrete one, don't I? No, yeah, I want the, okay, right. So domain event, 
dispatcher as I domain event dispatcher. Right, that's that's autofac syntax. Okay. And if we go look at that domain event dispatcher, it's gonna want this I component context container, which is an autofac thing. I'm gonna guess autofac already knows what to do with that. We'll find out in a minute. So let's run it. Let's see what our next error is. Hey, no error. Ship it. Um, exclusive PR, thank you for following. All right, so here's our app. And if we try and log in uh, with a demo user account, it might work. And that worked, but did it. I'm not logged in. Hmm, that's weird. Uh, that's not ideal. I'm looking for things to blow up, not just silently fail. Uh, let's see, there's a warning. Doesn't know about HTTPS, that's okay. Bunch of calls to the database that seem to work. All right. Oops, that just shut down the web server. That wasn't what I wanted to click. Uh, let's start this thing again. It's weird that login just silently disappeared like that. Login. It should say welcome whoever, right? Uh, let's see, register. Correct, neighbor 7778, that is, that is totally correct. Uh, let's register as something. There we go. Ah, so this is what I want. Um, I'm running on localhost, I'm running in development, so I should be getting this error because I don't have a local SMTP server running. So if I go into Dropbox, go to my Utilities folder, and find my SMTP for dev, and run that. You can download SMTP for dev off of GitHub. Um, it's listening now on port 25. So if I refresh this and run it, and do foo2 with whatever, oh, you're not going to give it to me twice. at bar.com. Hey, that worked. Uh, no, I don't need to save that. But look, I got an email. So this is what I want to happen, is that I can test with local email. I can inspect this, and I can say, hey, go confirm your account by going here. Uh, and so I can actually test that I can do account confirmation. If I can grab the whole link. There. And come over here and pretend that I just clicked this link from my email uh, and that didn't quite work either, did it? Uh, hmm. What's wrong with this? I wonder if, if I log in now as foo2 at bar.com password log in email sent again it is actually sending emails. That's good. Here's the new one. Inspect that. There's my thing. I wonder if it's HTTP encoding it somehow badly. Or if I click too far. That all looks good. But when I paste this in here, this is the wrong behavior. It shouldn't do that. Something's wrong with my auth. And that wasn't a problem before, but the part that is working seems to be all the, uh, you see an ampersand. Yeah, I saw that too. Any benefit of using Autofac? Um, well, last week I would have said yes, uh, because it gives you this nice automatic registration stuff, but, uh, but it's causing me some issues at the moment. But it does have a lot of features that uh, the built-in one doesn't, right? So uh, the fact that I can put a module into the infrastructure project that has all those infrastructure dependencies in it and not have to clutter up my application with that stuff is a, is a benefit I see. Um, it's like knowing about all these things and setting them up in the project where they live, right? In this infrastructure project instead of in my web project. That's a benefit, I think, right? That helps keep my code more modular and self-contained because only this thing needs to know about it. Uh, in fact, I could get to the point where I could get rid of 
my references, right? If I look at references on web, it has a reference to infrastructure. I could get rid of that reference to infrastructure uh, at one point and make it so that uh, I just load this module using reflection inside startup. Uh, and maybe I'll do that at one point. What that does is it makes sure that nothing in your web project is directly using stuff from infrastructure, which it shouldn't be. You mostly use Ninject, yeah. So Ninject has a bunch of features beyond the, the built-in service collection also. So either, either one. The same reason you would use Autofac is the same reason you would use Ninject, just because of those features. Surly Dev, you just watched the uh, proxy pattern. I noticed you're not saying that it was any good or that you liked it, so I appreciate that you watched it. And look at that, my stream element bot actually pointed to my Pluralsight courses. Yay, something's working. Well, hopefully the proxy pattern was useful for you. I'm working on the singleton pattern at the moment, um, which will be a whole lot of information about how to do the singleton pattern the right way, followed by uh, don't use the singleton pattern. Go ahead, ask me your questions. I'm going to continue to try and figure out why my authentication is not working. Uh, well, you can't sign in without a confirmed email. Sure, sure. That makes sense. Uh, and I can't confirm my email because why? Alright, so I know why sign in is not working because I'm not confirmed. I could force it to be confirmed here. Let's cheat and do that for now. <clears throat> and then we'll figure out why it's not working. So here's my Dev Better web app. Here's my tables. This is all local. Uh, let's go look at my users and show me all the data. Nebrio asks, what's the best way to handle email notification functionality for SIT, UIT environment if we don't want to send an email to the actual email address? That is what I'm doing right now, actually, right? I don't want to send an email for real, so I'm using localhost uh, SMTP, and I'm making sure I've got SMTP for dev installed. You could also just wire up a, a fake email sender that doesn't send email at all, right? Um, but basically, you, you want to have a reliable way to switch per environment which type of thing you're implementing the email with. Uh, in my case, the two things I'm using are localhost and um, SendGrid. Okay, so I was logging in with this foo2 at bar.com, which I just created a moment ago. And it has a property on here, a column on here, called email confirmed, right there. And it's false. We're going to say it's true. Now it's true. Um, so now we're going to run this. Oh, it's still running. So now we're going to go to it again, here. And we're going to try and log in one more time with foo2 at bar.com with our super secret password and now we're in and the reason why are we no we're still not in why are we still not in i really want us to be in just so i can verify all my services are registered correctly before i push this to production steve with the beard yeah this is like day 35 or so of the quarantine beard um, I haven't shaved since like March 14th or so. We'll see. Uh, I have another question. Do you really keep bees? Implement oh, that's a big question I missed. Sorry. Yes, I have bees. Um, so I'll answer that one real quick. Uh, we have uh, four hives. One of them didn't make it over the winter, so it's really like three and a half. We did a split of one hive last week or two weeks ago. Uh, I don't have high hopes that it'll make it, so probably I have three actual living hives at the moment. Um, but I haven't checked on them in a little bit because it's been really cold. Surly Dev says, I think I implemented the proxy pattern recently by creating a class library to access a credit insurance service we use. I created a WinForms front end to help me develop my library with the intent that the library will be used from an MVC front end, which I also started developing. All the connection details and management of the JOT for the 60 minutes is valid are all managed by the library. The UI knows nothing of this. Have I dot 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 implemented the proxy pattern? Um, sure, maybe. Uh, are you controlling access to some resource, perhaps that remote uh, resource that knows about um, the credit insurance stuff, and you're wrapping it with a library that understands all the credit, de uh, the connection details and credentials and timeouts and all that stuff, um, so that the rest of your UI code doesn't need to worry about it? If so, then yeah, I would say that's a proxy pattern. That would be a uh, remote proxy. 
Um, it's also got credentials and stuff in it, so you could say it's a protective proxy as well, uh, perhaps, right? Um, usually most remote proxies know about some kind of credentials, you know, if they're not just hitting a public endpoint, but, but yeah. Um, thanks, got you, haha, <laughs> hope quarantine will finish. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting to see how long the beard gets, um, although I have to say my wife's not a big fan of it, so it may have to go away faster than quarantine does. Right now in Ohio, they're saying we're going at least till May 1st, so another two weeks. Um, but it won't surprise me if we keep on quarantining. Yeah, the library takes generic company information from the UI, does the JSON parsing, calls a service, etc. Yeah, that sounds like a proxy, and it's giving you a benefit of having all that stuff in one place, uh, so it's not spread out everywhere, or it's not polluting your UI code, right? So sounds sounds good. Sounds like you're using the proxy the right way. Thanks for the follow, Mick Lauritsen. Appreciate it. Just returns information about the company. The UI doesn't know whether it comes from a database or the API. Right, perfect. It's an abstraction. It, the UI shouldn't need to know where it's coming from. All right. Um, so this right here is not what it should be. And that's because something's going on where we're confirming the email. And we get in a confirm email. And it should confirm the email, but it's not. And that's because it says, hey, model state is invalid. Now, why is model state invalid? I don't know. Um, but that seems to be the problem, and it might be because of this thing being encoded somehow. And in that case, i got to figure out, like, that and ampersand semicolon, that's probably the problem. Um, Alright, let's, let's do this one more time. Um, hmm. Close that, log in, foo2, I'm already... I already said I'm verified, though. Right? That should be verified, so that should work. That's not even what I just did, is it? Let's try this one more time. I'll even try a demo user, it's fine. Log in. Alright, it did stuff, but I'm not logged in. Mm, nothing here is warning me. Now I almost have too much logging, right? So, route match for account login. Good. Executing. Model state is valid. Good. Identity external. Model state is valid. Go executed login. Here's my post to login. Model state is valid for the post. That's what I want. Identity DB context. Go and make some SQL calls to get my username. Select my name from there. Yada yada yada. Identity application signed in. All right, so great. I'm signed in. Uh, redirecting to slash. Okay, great. Why are you still showing me as not logged in now? Hmm. It's weird. I wonder if I can use just clear all my cookies or something. Sometimes it's that. Let's restart this app too. Alright, do that. Put this over there. Log in with that one. Doesn't work. Nothing works. Alright, there's a way. That's okay. Let's go to application, clear storage, clear site data, boom, refresh. Now I'm not logged in for sure. So I should have no cookies. Yeah, that's fine. Log in, log in. Now I've got my ASP.NET Core cookie. Hey, look, I finally logged in. Okay, so it must have been a cookie issue. Thank you. 
Okay, now that I'm logged in, the whole reason for that was I want to be able to test other stuff and see if anything blows up, uh, which it's not, so that's good. Damn, there we go. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for things that are going to break because I haven't registered them. Um, and so here I've got this member registration service that is breaking. So that is telling me that in here I need to also register a member registration service, which is... Where is that? It's a, in the core, I think. Core, services, member registration service. Perfect. So... No, no, I don't need you, or you, I just need you. All right, so a common dependency that I'm going to use everywhere, builder.register type of member registration service, without an I, as I member registration service. Oh, come on, there we go. And I need to do a control dot to bring that in. Cool, cool. Just returns information about the company. All right, still the same chat message that was there before. All right. It'd be nice if Chatty, here's the Chatty app that I'm using. It'd be nice if Chatty like showed me the ones that I'd already read somehow. Like it has no way of knowing that, but like when I'm trying to work over here and then I look over here to see what, what people have said, you know, I, I'm, I'm always reading like the last few. I'm like, did I read that already? So I wish there were a way for it to maybe light up for a few seconds and then you know fade away once it's no longer new after 30 seconds or something and I can just look at the ones that are highlighted get out of here all right that should do the trick so let's kill this let's rebuild this let's or run this I mean run this okay and we're still signed in uh, go to my profile and now it works look at that um, that is looking pretty close to done with this bug, I think. So now let's see if we can get this thing into production. So I have this thing set up with continuous integration. So we can go to Team Explorer and go here and go find my changes and say, well, hang on, let's clean up some stuff first. Let's go back to this container setup. I don't think I need this anymore. So because I don't, yeah, I'm just going to delete it. Um, part of me wants to just comment it out in case I need it later, but that's what source control is for. So that's gone. And then startup. Almost got some stuff in here too. Don't think I need that. I definitely don't need this. Okay, so this right here is possibly, well, it's not the only one, but it's, it's close to one of the only places that I'm referencing infrastructure. Um, this one's also an infrastructure, this one's also an infrastructure, but eventually I could pull all those things out and then here I could dynamically load the infrastructure DLL uh, instead of having to have a project reference on it. And that's what I was talking about earlier when I said we wouldn't even have to have a reference from web to infrastructure. Um, but we're not going to get into that right now. We're just going to save this and finish our commit so we can get this into production. So. Enter commit message, yeah. Um, added auto fac module stopped registering things automatically. Uh, doing it explicitly based on environment now. Commit all things. I saw someone developing a Stream Deck plugin would flash the buttons, and I thought it would be handy to grab the streamer's attention. Sure, yeah, that would be cool. Um, sync and sync and just keep syncing until you're done. Okay, now I have a Discord thingy here and that Discord thingy is in streamer mode, um, but it has here my new commits. Um, and I can click on that and it should take me right to my page. There's my commit, there's my GitHub actions. So I've got continuous integration and continuous deployment going on here. So this is the publish flow, because I committed straight to master. Normally I do a pull request. So if I do a pull request, there's a separate build and test step that hits the pull request. Um, 
but this will let me know as soon as it actually finishes deploying um, in this Discord, which is nice. Uh, you can set that up in GitHub. And I, I just wrote a blog post uh, a couple weeks ago that talks about how to do Discord integration, which I'm using. Um, some kind of message made, oh, I missed your other message, because, you know, highlighting doesn't exist. Maybe with a way of someone highlighting that they have a question about your current thing, such as question, did you mean to type that on my next? Yeah, that'd be cool. Um, I was just watching Brian Lagunas' stream a couple days ago, and he had a thing he was using, I think it was his, that was like a, a highlighted chat, um, where you could click on a chat question, and it would show it inside of uh, OBS as like a highlighted thing. Um, and so there'd be like, you know, like a, a block or a box or something here that would show the contents of, of what they said. So if somebody does have a question, um, on my layout, I've got the chat, you know, in the, in the stream, uh, mostly so that on YouTube later, people can actually see what people are saying. Um, but this would achieve that too, right? I could just click on the question and it would show up here. What was that thing called? Um, uh, I've got it on another computer, but I don't have it on this one. What was it, uh, Twitch highlighted comment, something like that. Uh, highlights, which highlights, oh, something like that. Promoted highlight, promoted comment. I don't know. I'll have to find it on another machine. All right, this thing reliably takes about three and a half minutes. So I'm kind of killing time here, waiting for this to finish. Uh, feature chat. Thank you, Surly Dev. Lucky number 11. Got it. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. Say it louder, Surly Dev. I can't, I can't hear you. Uh, all right. Featured chat for Twitch. Featured dot chat. Perfect. Um, so how do I, how do I do this? That's, I like this thing. Show me. 12 hey guys, minutes. Try to shrap no, I don't have 12 minutes. No, at least not on the stream. So let's just see if we can read this. Link your Twitch account. Add some moderators. The moderators apparently could do the featureizing, perhaps. Hmm. Works well when a streamer wants to highlight a message to other viewers. Yes. Okay, let's feature chats. Boom, boom. On deck. Hit this. Do that. Now showing. Okay. Cool. So I'm going to do exactly what I did last time I read this, which is look at it later. And then hopefully actually do it. Um, but yeah, I'll try and get featured chat working sometime. Maybe we'll play with it after uh, this works. All right, this just told me things were successful. And then this just updated too, uh, which means that now we ought to be able to go out to the DevBetter website. This whole stream is just a commercial for devbetter.com, which is my you know group coaching service that I give. Uh, let's see, it must be restarting. There we go. I am logged in. Uh, this is for real this time. And what do I want to test? If I log out and then I say I forgot my password, it will do that. That's not good. Um, I didn't test this before, did I? Uh, I need an I email sender to be wired up. All right, back to the drawing board. So back here, email sender is the SendGrid email sender. And that's implementing a type, an interface that I don't own. Uh, and really all it does is, is pass it along to one I do own. So this is just a wrapper, essentially. Um, so email sender is a Microsoft ASP.NET Core type. I have an email service that looks very similar. And this just delegates to my configured email service. Now I thought I email sender, I think that was once set up here uh, at one time, but I've since gotten rid of it apparently. So we'll just wire it up here with everything else. And it's just gonna do the default thing. So builder.register type of, uh, it says send grid email sender, but that's a really bad name. Uh, let's just call this, because this thing doesn't know anything about SendGrid, so we're going to call this default. Default email sender. Uh, control dot, rename. Your rename is not smart enough to rename the file. Shame on you, Visual Studio. You really ought to figure that one out at some point. Alright, well, I like that better. Now over here, this is default email sender. As I email sender. Uh, and you don't have the 
ASP.NET thing that we need. There we go. Pull in the using statement with control dot. Rename the file first, it will offer to rename the class. Yeah, I know, but that's not how I think about it. I'm already in the class when I want to rename it. Um, so I don't want to have to rethink how I'm thinking about it because Visual Studio can't figure that out. I mean, obviously it knows how to do both operations. It just needs to do them both ways, right? ReSharper did it e either way, I'm pretty sure, like 10 years ago. Um, don't get me wrong, Visual Studio is awesome, but there's still a little little things they can still polish up. Okay, that should work. Now, if I'm smart, I'll test this locally so that I don't have to waste four minutes doing this thing. So we're going to log out, log in, forgot password for a real email, submit, and boom. I get my email right there, reset password. Perfect. Nothing blew up. So now we can commit. Team Explorer, click, 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 click. Uh, Added registration for I email sender used by identity commit. What are y'all saying? I think it's getting better. It's definitely getting better. Yeah, Visual Studio 2019 is awesome. Uh, and so is VS Code. Mick Lortzen, thanks for joining me. It's only just discovered 10 minutes and sadly have to go already. See you next Friday. Oh, sorry to see you go. Have a good weekend. Watch the uh, the YouTube stream at 2x speed. It's a it's a good use of your time. It's, you know, it takes half the time. Also, I just tried registration. I'm getting extended socket exception. Yes, that's because you don't have this uh, SMTP server set up. If you're trying to do this at home, um, you want to install some kind of SMTP server on your local machine. So uh, to do that, you want to go to uh, SMTP for dev is one. Um, or the other one is paper cut. Paper cuts uh, mail server. Uh, paper cut you can also set up as a uh, Docker container. Um, but yeah, these are super useful. So naked flame. I never knew about SMTP for devs. It is it is really nice for this type of testing. SMTP. I don't want to know what happens in there. <laughs> um, yeah. So paper cuts another good one. And if you are using Docker. Uh, you can say docker paper cut server and go here maybe this, I don't remember which one is the one I want um, docker. But there's a way that you can just do a you know a docker run paper cut uh, it'll download it and then just run this localhost SMTP and it's it's pretty sweet I think there's one for SMTP for dev as well. You can say docker run SMTP for dev. Uh, and there's that one. No, that's GitHub. Where's the docker? Mail hog, mail dev. Mail dev does essentially the same thing. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to do this. They're all basically the same idea. Um, but the docker one has like a, a web page you can go to that'll show you all the emails. Uh, as opposed to this tray icon that shows them to you. All right, so anyway, get one of those and run it, and then you'll get rid of that error. Uh, Nibro7778. All right. In my case, I think I'm good. So I fixed this, I think. Um, I verified it locally, so we're good to commit. And I was about to do that, and I committed. Now I need to push. Push, 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 push. Do it. All right. Successfully pushed Discord. What do you got to say about that? Yep, there it is. Pushed. Um, let's uh, see when it starts to build. Yep. This is the slow part. Action. Uh, let's see. There's a way to list all your Docker containers. Docker con ls container. Docker. So, yeah. There's a bunch of stuff. Uh, while I'm waiting, I just want to see if I already have this SMTB for dev thing running or if I still have it somewhere. Kubernetes, other junk. No. Docker. Docker container ls, thank you. Docker container 
Uh, and I should pipe that to some grep to show me anything that says mail, but these are all Kubernetes pods, so no, I don't have it. Um, has anybody done it? Docker, container, I think it was uh, not M7T proof dev, I think it was the other one, I think it was paper cut. Server. Uh, and this blog post probably tells me what I need. So you go here and say Docker, Docker image, Docker container, blah, blah, blah. Show me the command that I need, right? There's a public image that I know I've used. One more thing I want to mention that I try registration on production, so it also requires some people to have installed my local. I want to mention that I tried registration on production. No, no. If you do production, it needs SendGrid. Uh, if you're trying to do my code on your machine, in production you need to have a SendGrid key. And when you don't have a SendGrid key, which I don't on my local, uh, if I run this in production locally, it'll blow up um, and it'll say send grid key. Is that what it's called? It was just key. That's not a good thing to search for. Uh, send grid. There's an exception that I throw somewhere. Um, and the string. There it is right there. So if you don't have this uh, SendGrid key, it's going to go into the SendGrid email service and it's going to look for your SendGrid key in your options and it's going to throw this exception. Now you can get a free SendGrid account if you want to play with this and test it out. Um, and then in your app settings.json, there's nothing. Um, there used to be a SendGrid thing there, but basically it looks like... Where's my SendGrid config? in here. It's sender auth message. Maybe it's that? Yeah. I don't know why I called it auth message. I just may as well just call it send grid options because the send grid's right in the name right there. So you just need an auth message sender options thing in here. So this would be like that would be that. And then this would be send grid key. And your key would go here. And then your password would go here. Just don't commit that. Um, if you commit your send grid key into GitHub into open source then people can use it that you don't want using it. <laughs> All right, uh, this thing says that we deployed successfully. This article did not tell me what I wanted to know. I really just want to know the Docker container that has what I want. Uh, we'll come back to that. Let's go test devbetter.com. All right, sorry that's so slow. It had to restart. Log in with, actually, no, forget password for this. And if this works, then that means I fixed my bug. <sighs> Seriously? Okay, so it still has the same error in production. Why is it doing that? Okay, well, Nebro, you're seeing maybe the same thing that I just discovered, which is that this is not doing what it should do. Um, hmm. I have some middleware in here that will show all my services. And if I run that middleware right here, it's going to show me all my services. And I'm going to say email, and there's that, and then there's that. Is it just mail? Of services. I think maybe the autofact ones aren't shown. Yeah. That's too bad. It's going to be more useful if it showed me all the autofact ones also. Alright. Well, let's think about this. Why? I register this module, I tell it whether we're in development. Environment is development. Okay. I really ought to be in production mode in the server. I'm pretty sure I am, but that could be the problem. So 
One possible issue is that out on Azure, I'm in development. That was an issue I was having because I had a s what? I had a setting here. Hmm. And it was getting pushed up to Azure, and I got rid of it. But it's back. Why is it back? Right, this was biting me before. And I fixed it and I checked it in, and somehow it got added back in here. I don't know why that web config file is doing that. Um. All right, let's see if that's all it is. Because if I'm in development mode out in Azure, that's the problem. And that makes me happy that it, it's that easy, but it's sad that web config is a problem again. Exeget E46, yeah, those are uh, all those built-in services for the most part. Um, that, well, along with ones I've added, right? Like Entity Framework and Identity and stuff like that. But they're all framework things, not my uh, application services. Remove environment equals development again I did this before sync push all right. I really don't want any web config stuff at all right I, I don't care if it's running iOS um, so I may just delete this whole thing and if I can I don't know that'll probably break stuff all right so now we're waiting for it to build again meanwhile Let's go look and see if there's if it's possibly anything else. Um, so for let's let's follow this logic here. Um, we're gonna pass in is development. It's gonna be true if we're in development. It's gonna override that. All right. So if we are in development, then we're gonna register the development only dependencies, which is local SMTP. Otherwise, we're not in development. We're in production. We're gonna register only the production things, which is Send grid. Pretty simple. A lot of work. There's my commit. All right. While we're waiting for that, let's go find the Docker container in the public repo for Papercut. Uh, let's try this. Papercut MF. I don't know what MF is. It's probably not what I'm thinking it is. Docker run. Blah blah. That's a lot of crap to pass into that. Okay, no, that's not the one I've used before. Uh, MF site? I don't know what MF is. Mail something? Uh, that's not it either. Uh, Docker paper cut. Is that it? No. It's an NG server. I don't know what NG is either. I don't know if these paper cuts are the same paper cut that I've used. Anybody else use a Docker container as your SMTP server? So I know I've done it. I probably even blogged about it if I was smart. Um, have I ever talked about this before? No, of course not. Let's do Docker registry. Paper cut SMTP for dev. Try either one. Uh, this uh, that doesn't uh, have Docker registry in it. I really would like for it to have Docker and registry. Um, this one maybe. There we go. I think this might be it. So we're gonna run that. It's always Mailgun. Mailgun's fine as well. Yep. I don't think I've used that one. Right, I need to get this guy to stop listening. So here's SMTP for dev somewhere there. I'm going to say stop listening. Because if it's listening, then I won't be able to do this Docker thing. Um, but I'm just going to Docker run that guy. So I copied it, paste that, run it. It's going to have to pull it down. So there it's fetching it. And wait for it Sing. there it goes now I'm gonna allow it on my firewall and now it's listening on port 25 running in production I guess it's running ASP.NET Core so it definitely looks like Kestrel uh, it's also listening on 37408 so if I go to localhost colon 37408 it's 
good. This is what I've seen before. All right. Uh, sure, allow notifications. That sounds useful. Um, and so there it is. It's running. Now, if I go back to my local host and run, and remember on local host, it's going to use a local mail server. I can come in here and I can say I forgot my password for whoever. Submit. And that should do something. So this thing got hit. No, that's me. Uh, this thing. Did it get hit? I don't think so. Uh, there's still nothing in my inbox. Hmm. But it did try and send it locally. And it didn't blow up. Post to forgot password. Oh, you can't, you know, it doesn't actually send the email at that point, that's why. Uh, that's a stupid feature. Okay, let's try this again. Foo2 is actually a, a valid user. Aha, there, that worked. Okay, there we go. So Foo2 got the email. There's no deliver to console email framework. <laughs> deliver to console. What do you mean deliver to console? I mean, effectively, this is a console app because it's just a Docker run command. Um, so I need to remember to blog that so I don't have to search for it again. But yeah, if you do this docker run command and then you hit this web page, you know, it's essentially the same as using SMTP for dev. Um, except you don't have to keep SMTP for dev around, you just have to keep this string around to run. And if you run that string, then you're good to go. Um, Alright, that should have killed enough time that we should have redeployed, which it did. That's good. And that means that I can go back out here, and I don't even remember what I was changing to test this. I get rid of the web config thing. That's what it was. So we can log in. So we forgot our password. So here's my email. Submit. And if it's running in production, it should use SendGrid. And it didn't blow up. That's a good sign. And over here on my other monitor, I have... Uh, doo -doo -doo. Aha, I have a reset password. Perfect. So this just came in. Uh, so I think we're good, uh, which is great. So that means now I can go all the way back to here and make a note that uh, web config seem to have development environment set in it again. Not sure why. I don't know what's doing that. It's really annoying. Um, but this is fixed. Alright, so now let's see if there's any other issues here that I want to mess with right now. I think that's good enough. I had some other stuff I wanted to work on on a different project, so I think we might shift gears here. Does anybody have any questions before I do? I'm going to go to my uh, clean architecture open source project here in a second, I think, because it had some stuff. Uh, Exeget. In a couple of frameworks I've seen in development, the email just outputs in the server logs. Um, you could easily do that yourself, right? It's not You don't need an email framework for that. You just need an email service here. So I have a local SMTP service that does this, but if I wanted one to just log stuff, I would just create a, a log, you know, logger email service. And I would pass it in a logger, and then in here I would say logger.log information whatever, right? To, from, email, subject, whatever. Um, and then that would be all you would need. And then it would just decide which whether or not you wanted both of those there. Um, if you wanted to always log, then you could use that thing as a proxy uh, or a decorator and maybe wrap the logger around your regular email service. Um, it doesn't sound like that's what you're asking for, but that would be another option so that you could have the logging logic be separate from the actual implementation of how you're emailing. Um, which actually sounds kind of nice right now. That might be something I try and do. Because uh, then I could also log the type of the thing. You know what? Let's just do that. Uh, I like that idea. Let's do a logger decorator. So public class uh, logger email service decorator email service. Because you know what this would say? It would also say which type of thing it was using. 
um, this is the part that might get tricky though. I'm going to have to look up how to do uh, decorators. Um, Alright, and then we need to implement that. And then we need to also take in an iLogger of T, which I think I'm using. Do I have my own logger yet? I usually implement my own logger. I don't think so. I think I'm just using that, so that's fine. Use that. The logger, I logger of, logger, email, service, decorator, there, click that, there, alright, now this, logger dot, log information, using, email, service, implementation, of, whatever, comma, uh, type of actual email service. Why are you not giving me intelligence? Should be that. Method locks it wait. Yeah, I know. Um, await actual dot send email subject message. Type her namespace actual email service. Typed it. What did I miss? Cannot be found. It's right there. Say dot get type. I uh, got it. I've not done email in dot net yet. Rails has been my go to, and the logging is baked in. Okay. Uh, let's do get type. Maybe that'll work. That looks fine. And the other thing you want to do is logger.log .log information, sending email to zero from one with subject. I don't actually have the, t the from two with subject one and message to email subject message. All right, there's that. Now this should work. Um, are you going to upload your stream to YouTube or somewhere else for future reference? Sorry, I'm going to sleep now. Yeah, no worries. It's going to be up on uh, uh, YouTube.com slash rdallas. So, sorry about the time difference. I've been to uh, Sydney. It's, it's awesome. Um, I'd love to get back there sometime. Uh, so, hopefully the... Uh, Coronavirus isn't hitting you guys too hard there. Okay, so then I want to do a quick check to see how to do a decorator in Autofac. Because it's going to be a thing that they just have a syntax for. Probably. Adapters and decorators. Um, Alright, so decorator pattern. Let me wrap something. That's done. Okay, simplified syntax, simplified decorators. Register type, register type, register decorator of this around that. Okay, that looks like exactly what I want. Okay, that looks perfect. Thank you for being easy, uh, Autofac. So when I go now to my infrastructure module here, uh, regardless of the email service that I'm registering down here, and I hope the order doesn't matter, uh, builder.register register decorator uh, logging email service decorator of uh, 
my email service. All right, let's read those docs a little bit more. A little more flexible. This registers decorator can register multiple decorators. They'll be applied in the order that you register them. Oh. So my question is, can I register this decorator before I register these? Because that's the order I'm doing it here. But I don't have to do it that way. I could always just say, you know what? Let's register the common stuff down there and it should still work. So let's try that. Good night, neighbor. All right, so let's, uh, let's build this. And I just want to see if this decorator works because you know, I literally just threw it together in a minute there, and that would be helpful to me to be able to see the output. All right, so let's run this thing locally again, and let's do something that would send an email. Uh, let's go forgot password, let's go there. We're still running, still running that server, this paper cut server, so that should catch the email. That worked, paper cut says, Got another email a few seconds ago. That's good. What did we get in our log output? I'm hoping we got a log message here that said, hey, we're gonna use email service implementation local SMTP, and we're gonna send an email here with all this. That sounds good. It looks like that worked. All right, so setting up a logger decorator was really easy, actually. Um, so let's just push that code to production and Hope for the best. Uh, let's go Team Explorer. Because now I, I would be able to see, if I'm not getting emails, I'd be able to tell whether it was because something was wrong with SendGrid or somehow my registration was wrong or whatever. Added a logger decorator for email service. And wired it up with Autofac. All right. Earlier, somebody was asking, well, why would you use Autofac? And being able to do that really flexibly and easily would be one reason to use Autofac, because doing that with just the regular services container would be a little more challenging. Mostly because it would be um, harder to wrap this around whichever one of these was being done. Right? If it was always wrapped around the same thing, it would be easy. Um, it's a little bit harder to do it with one of these. You can still do it, um, but you have to write more code. Uh, all right, so sync and push, and hopefully that's all just going to work. Let's uh, let's load up clean architecture while that's waiting. Do 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 there. Uh, somebody had posted an issue about wiring this thing up to use um, endpoints correctly and and a host instead of a web host. Because this has been upgraded from 2.2 to 3.1, but it's still using an iWebHost builder instead of a host builder. Uh, and so we're going to look at that as our next thing that I'm queuing up. Um, while I'm thinking about it, let me go over here and add a couple notes to myself. I want to blog about. Uh, this thing so I don't forget it next time and now I can delete that because I have a note and I don't need that and I don't need that and I don't need that let's see if feature chat let's make a note to set that up no I don't need that I'm basically just turning tabs into to-do items um, that worked nicely. That I'm not doing. I'm done with that. We're streaming. We're good. Alright, look at all those tabs I got rid of. Uh, Alright, so this hasn't yet finished building yet. You're still doing that, okay. Uh, meanwhile, let's go. Does anybody else have any questions in the chat? No. Let's open up Clean Architecture. So we're going to github.com, like our Dallas, like Clean Architecture. The DevBetter website is actually built on top of this. Uh, this is a solution template you can use. The DevBetter site basically was started a year and a half ago. Um, so it's not on the latest version of this. And in fact, we might be able to use code from DevBetter's website to improve the other one, because I might have upgraded this one ahead of it. 
Yeah, this is using an iHost builder. All right, so this is what we want is iHost builder, something like this, uh, that's gonna get called in clean architecture. So here's clean architecture and it needs now one of these guys, create a host builder. Um, am I using auto fact in here? I think I was. Container setup initially, yeah, there's auto fact. All right, so I probably do need that. Um, host builder needs extensions hosting, auto fact service provider factory needs auto fact dependency injection. I don't care about max request bytes for this application, so configure Kestrel server. I just don't need that. I don't need server options at all, do I? Uh, I don't need any of that. Web host, web builder dot use startup dot configure logging. Add Azure Web App Diagnostics. I'm going to comment that out and say add this if deploying to Azure. Because that bit me before. All right, now this finished up. So uh, let's go verify we're all set now with logging in production. Uh, we don't need paper cut anymore. Let's go to devbetter.com and just make sure it doesn't blow up, but let's also go to the Azure portal. Okay, no, go away. Let's go to DevBetter. This is my web app. Um, let's just load it up. We're gonna go here. We're gonna say, we forgot our password for me. And I wanna see the log output for this. So we're gonna go attach the log viewer. And I turned on logging earlier this morning. It only lasts for like 12 hours if you're using disk-based logging, um, but I am, and uh, it should still be working. So it says I'm connected. Uh, let's test it out. Let's submit. And that worked. And in my email, I got another email, so it worked there. Now let's check the log stream. And the log stream says right here, Using email service implementation, da, 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 send grid email service. Uh, and there's my decorator. All right, let's do that. Sweet. So that worked. Uh, and it worked in production. So it doesn't really work until it's in production. Um, okay, so I think we're done with DevPetter for now. I'm pretty happy with that. We got some stuff working. I got 20 issues on clean architecture. That's way too many. Uh, and one of them is AutoFact with iHost Builder, iHost Builder, WebHost Builder, these two. One of them is these two, okay. Two of them is these two. So my friend here, DRD Git says, ASP.NET 3X, you should be using iHost Builder. And as you're using a WebHost Builder, what the heck? He didn't say what the heck, but you know, it's implied. Um, all right, we don't need this anymore. And nobody else wants to talk to me. You guys are being awfully quiet in the chat. Anybody got a joke? Tell us a joke in the chat. Clean jokes only. Bonus points if it's about .NET. Um, all right, so we're gonna thumbs up that guy. We're gonna fix this. So in here, in clean architecture, no jokes. Come on, you're making me do all the lifting here. for a joke, but they're all awful. I'm not gonna send you any of those. All right, um, I think this is all I need, right? And so up here, where I say create web host builder, args build, I really just want it to be create host builder, args build. And I probably should have run this to verify it actually worked before I start doing surgery on it, but I think we're good. Okay. The only thing we're doing is adding some logging to it, which should be 
basically the default anyway, but I wanted to call this out because that bit me the other day. And let's just try it. Let's just run it. I think this is going to knock out two issues. Except that it blows up. Uh, there's my blow up. Can't do configure services. I'm turning an IS service provider in .NET Core 3. Yeah, I know that. Why is that code still there? Somebody should raise an issue telling me that I have bad code still there. And the reason is because that's not how you do it in 3.1. In 3.1 you do this code that's over here in my startup. There it is. Uh, you do configure container. That's what you want. And you make sure configure services is void. So when I call this, it's blowing up because my uh, iHost builder no longer supports the returning of an iHost service provider here. This has to be void. Uh, and instead of returning something here, we're going to do this. And I could just call that. But it wants those services. I'm actually pretty happy with this whole module thing, though. Instead of this junk I was doing before. Um, populate and register. So this is doing the same thing with the magic. And this is getting the builder and returning the built builder. You don't do this part, right? ASP.NET Core will do the build for you. So you only have to call all the setup things. You don't actually have to call build. Um, so I don't think I want any of that. I think I want to just steal the code from here that uses this module. Copy that over to Clean Architecture and paste it right here. And then these all go away. And we'll keep the is development stuff that might be useful. Uh, register type. You you have a domain event dispatcher. Where are you? Domain events. Domain event dispatcher right there. So, you should be able to find a namespace for that. Oh shoot, I know why you can't, because this. There we go. Alright, webhook. We're not doing webhooks here. Uh, domain event dispatcher, domain event dispatcher, those can be chained together dot as this dot that I don't need that anymore uh, do I do email sending? I don't think I do there's no email sending in here so that can go away decorator can go away um, these can be just to fill in that I think we're in good shape okay now this thing wait what did I change in startup I think I passed the environment somewhere oh I know what I did I passed it into here and set it uh, so let's do that that. Alright, that's good. Now you know what environment is. You don't know what container builder is. Using autofac, you're okay. Alright, now I should just be able to comment this out and be good to go. Stop that. Get over there. Still nobody chatting. And no jokes. You guys are disappointing me. Um, Alright. 
What was that error? Container setup does not exist. Yeah, that's because I deleted it. Um, what are you trying to do? Domain event dispatcher should... I need to do the actual building of Autofac here. test. Um, what that test was trying to do here is the main event dispatcher should is it was trying to say if I have a container configured the way I normally would configure it and I pass it into a new instance of domain event dispatcher which uses that container to find handlers to, to call then if I create an event and I say hey go dispatch it and I need to get, get the wrapped handlers there should be some handlers reason there should be some handlers is because there's this handler right here that's always there. Um, and now if I want to pass that thing, uh, see I don't think the main events are going to work as it stands right now because I don't have anything in Autofac that's wiring them up anymore. I need something to tell it to register all of my iHandle events, uh, which I currently don't have. So I'm going to have to do something about this test. It's going to be broken for now. I think I just want to create a container builder. Let's see. Bar builder equals new container builder using Autofac. Like that. Builder dot register module of type new default infrastructure module and we'll say that we are is development colon true there we go now container equals builder dot build right um my container that's all i need that should work I mean, it probably doesn't work now, but it should eventually work. Okay, so now if we run this thing, it ran. Oh, look at that. All right, let me just uh, bring this over here. There you go. That's what the site looks like. Um, but it blows up because it doesn't have everything wired up. And then that's because I got rid of all the magic. So uh, I can't get an I repository. Okay, those should be scoped reference. So we're gonna go to our go here and our common dependencies include the repository So EF repository, EF repository, and that's why. EF repository, which is there, as I repository dot, and I don't want instance per lifetime, I don't think. Configure that in every dependent component or call within a single I lifetime scope. Is that what I want? I think that might be the same as, I want scoped, whatever scoped is. So autofac equivalent to .NET Core scoped lifetime. Comparing lifetimes. All uh, right, and my good friend Caesar here says uh, service lifetime transient and instance per dependency, instance per lifetime scope. And I think that's. That's all I need. So autofac is instance per lifetime scope. That's what that is. Um, and that's fine for both of these. So that should work. 
Let's uh, let's get rid of that. And let's build this thing again. And it keeps wanting to launch in the other screen, which is annoying. Dink, 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 dink. There we go. Load those things. That works. List those things. That works. So my repository works. Uh, swagger seems to work. There's info. It's fine. Um, razor page also works. Everything works. Um, all right. Who's texting me? Uh, yeah, it's just spam. No. All right, that's good. Now, still nobody chatting. I think I'm good. I think I'm fixing those two issues. Uh, let's see, there's that, that can go away. There's that, that can go away. Here we go. This one is about to be fixed. That's number 96. Remember that, 96 and 100. <laughs> okay, 96 and 100. Let's create a new pull request. So, we're going to go over here. We're going to create a new branch. We'll call it Ardalis Whack. Um, Aradalis. Ardalis. Ardalis. What am I doing here? I guess we're adding uh, iHost I environment. And autofax stuff. Create that branch, and then let's do all the things with committing. So changes, um, updated startup to use iHost, not iWebHost. Um, configure autofax using module. That's about all I did, right? Yeah. So commit. Um, I don't know, yeah, we can sync. I don't know if I'm ready to do a, uh, a pull request yet, because I still need to test. I'm pretty sure my test is still going to fail. So we'll push that up. Let's run our tests. So, test, explorer, run. The domain event handler test is likely to fail. All right, we got some failures. What failed? Domain event dispatcher should not return an empty list. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Um, so let's do a quick search for autofac, register, all implementations of interface. This is what I want. Register assembly types as close types of that. All right, so that's basically what I want. Let's see if there's a better answer than this. Those look nasty. Let's go back to here. Let's go back to our infrastructure module. And I think this is common. So I'm going to register event handlers here. Register assembly types in assemblies. I don't have a list of assemblies yet. That's going to be something I'll need to change. And this will be I handle of whatever. All right, so we need the assemblies. Where am I going to be handling stuff? It could be any one of these three assemblies. Um, let's just add them locally here. Well, I need to pass in. Well, I will need to pass in the assembly that web is coming from. And I had that code before. So let's go borrow it from my source code right here. Go over to infrastructure, container setup. I can get those two easily enough. All right, so private. Can't spell private. List of assembly. There's a new 
list. This and that are those. Assemblies.add core. Assemblies to add infra. Good. Uh, database populator needs to be using core. All right. That gives me core and infrastructure. I really need the web assembly too, though. So I'm going to say assembly calling assembly. And we'll just do assemblies.add calling assembly if it's not null. If you don't pass that, we'll just say it's null. So, if calling assembly not equal null, then we'll add it to the list. All right, now down here, this thing wants an assemblies of array. So, assemblies two array should do the trick. Now that should register everything that closes I handle. That should include this guy here, which is always present, which means my test ought to pass. That's what we're hoping for. And there were build errors. And let's do that alias. All right. Time is it? We got about 20 minutes left. We should get this done easily in that time. Everything built? Um, tests. Run those tests. Sweet. All right. I think it's working now. Um, less magic, but less failures. Sync. I think we're, we're good, right? That pushed that out. So let's go back out to clean architecture. And 96 at 100 is what we're trying to fix. So if we go to pull requests, there's that from five minutes ago. That sounds like too long ago. I'm pretty sure I wanted to push this thing like right now. Successfully synchronized. All right. That was never five minutes. Hmm. Let's try it. Updated startup to use iHost, not a web host. Um, figured out if I using module fine. Create pull request and see what our checks do with about this. This is failing. That's not good. Fix this test already, though. That says it's failed. So why? Why is it acting like? Oh, it was logging up. So interesting. Um, cd backslash cd dev cd github cd clean. Why is it acting like it didn't do all my changes? All right, there's my change to that. It's modified. Visual Studio. Is like, hey, you're fine, dude. Um, do I have to go and do that and that? Uh, okay. Visual Studio has way too much clicking involved. Uh, added registration of any handler implementing iHandle T. Commit. Now we can sync. And now we can push. Did someone say DDD? Oh, thank you, bot. Tony Davis, DDD question. What is your process for identifying bounded context when decomposing a system? Well, it's complicated. Um, for me, most of the time, bounded contacts tend to map to applications. Uh, that doesn't mean that that always solves that problem for you, because 
now you've just moved the problem of, well, how do I segment my applications, right? Um, but things work really nicely if each bounded context is its own Visual Studio solution, is its own repository, has its own executable, could be a microservice, could be a web app, could be whatever, but it's its own separate standalone thing. Um, so if that's helpful, if you already have made those decisions, then your bounded context decision maybe is easier, right? Because you already have things split out into different apps. You just say each one's a bounded context, boom, you're done. Um, if you don't have that, or if you don't like that approach, uh, because who knows if the apps are well, you know, organized and factored, then there's a whole bunch of other things, but it, essentially it's uh, try something, you know, look for some stuff that seem like they go together. Maybe you've got a huge monolithic app that does way too much, um, and you want to know, you know, what, what things go together and what things don't. You're asking about the, you've got a database schema, maybe look at foreign key constraints. The challenge with the database and foreign key constraints is that most large databases that care about referential integrity have constraints on every table that ultimately leads to almost every other table. Uh, and so if you try and like decouple this or decompose this uh, big ball of mud that is, that is your database schema, I haven't had a lot of success with that uh, in terms of it being easy. I've done it. I've, I've spent a lot of time looking and, and trying to understand the domain to figure out what could be broken apart. Um, but you can't just look at the database table and somehow like start slicing it, you know, without, without too much thought. Um, so the real answer is what I just said. It's spend some time with the domain, domain experts and figure out which things really are standalone uh, contexts in which people do things. And, and a lot of times it helps to think about this from the perspective of what operations do customers or users take and, and how do those operations uh, logically compose together into groupings. So, you know, and a lot of times these are going to be scenario dependent or use case dependent. Um, it's like, what are the things that a user might do with the Twitter app on their phone? Um, and that might be totally different than things that people do with Twitter everywhere else, right? But that could be, uh, you know, one way that you look at it is like, what, what is a, a cohesive set of operations that a user might do in a given context? Can I bound that context and say, okay, that's my application, that's it, that's all they're doing here. Uh, and I'm going to have my own storage, I'm going to have my own API through which I communicate with the rest of other services that I have. And there'll be maybe eventual consistency between those things. Um, but, but I'm going to think about it from the user perspective or from the domain expert perspective of, you know, in the real world, when the user's trying to interact with the system or trying to solve this problem, um, what, is, what is a set of operations they might perform in a given context? Devin Isabel, very well put, Ardellis. I suppose you know that, but maybe it's not said. I don't know what I said that you thought was well put. I said a whole lot there. Um, <clears throat> maybe the part about trying to understand the domain before you split it up. That would probably be the... The most obvious bit. Um, all right, where are we? Successfully pushed. Let's go. Let's go finish that pull request. Let's go see if this thing builds. Pull request. I created it right there. It's got a red X still. Yep. All right. Cool. Thanks, Dev Invisible. You're welcome, Tony. Uh, it's still failing. Why is it still failing? Azure Pipeline is failing. I've got I've got GitHub and Azure running on this. They're both failing. And it's probably failing with the same test failure. Those are all passing. And those are passing. And that is failing. Fail. Create table to do items. Why is that failing? SQL light is failing. Hmm. That's interesting. What am I doing with SQL light? Oh yeah, I switched this thing to use SQL light. Do I need to delete my SQL light database every time I check in? I mean, it's probably not good to have it in source control. But this all worked fine locally. Uh, let's look. In web, this database, it's ignored. It's okay, it's ignored, so 
Why is it, uh, why is it causing me problems out in my build pipeline? Hmm. Yeah, just to verify this. Everything's good to go here. .NET test. Let's see what happens when I run from the command line locally. We got about 10 more minutes and I want to be done with this. Everything works fine. Hey, it works on my machine. All right, ship it. So why are you failing on the build server? are unit tests, integration tests, functional tests are what's failing. And the functional test that's failing, I can't tell which one. It says there's only one. But that's not correct because when it's done it says there's three tests. Let's look at these functional tests. So in here, I've got functional tests of probably this one. Let's see, that one's just returning. It's not trying to create anything. And this one, it's just returning. And that one says, "Hey, use the in-memory database, not, not the uh, SQLite one." And this thing doesn't do anything with autofact, so probably there's some issue here that I've broken things with how I set things up with autofact. And this one just says return. So what exactly is going on that that it's trying to build something and blowing up? It must be that I'm seeding stuff here with populate test data. And this is going to remove all the things, save that, add these three things, and then save that. And these have no IDs. I wonder if it's not identity, adi adding the ID uh, sequentially, and it's zero. Why is that only a problem on the build server? I don't know. Why is it only happening on one of the three tests and not all of them? I don't know. Um, hmm. Thanks for the follow, Star What? Alright, table to do item already exists. Yeah. That's probably not good either. But it's trying to create this table and it's already there. Honestly, I don't know why it's doing anything with SQLite at all. Am I doing that? Nothing here says so, but. It's hard to tell. SQLite, SQLite, startup, setup, here. Public static, use SQLite, okay. But that's not called from my test. Have you ever tried event storming? Do you find that useful? I haven't used something that's formally event storming. I've watched some presentations on it. I haven't done it with a, a client myself. Um, I've done similar things where we are basically trying to come up with the bounded context like you were describing. Uh, and the exercise involves figuring out what the domain elements are. And those include entities and value objects and aggregates and things like that, but also events. Like I'm always sure to include events when I'm doing that. Uh, and if you do it with like uh, sticky notes or index cards or something like that, you can try and use different uh, colors for the different types of things. So your entities would be one color, your events would be a different color um, as one approach. And then you just try and draw a circle around some of them, right? And really that's all domain driven design is, right? Is group things together and draw circles around them and then apply encapsulation. So. You know, I've got a bunch of functions that do stuff. 
I'd like to organize those functions and, and you know, treat some rules around them. What could I do with that? Well, I'm going to draw a circle around them and call that circle a class. And it's going to be an entity, or it's going to be a service, or whatever it is. Right? I'm going to add encapsulation rules to say that you can't mess with its internal state. And it's always going to be valid because of, you know, some restrictions I put on it. And then I'm going to do the same thing with aggregates. I'm going to say, well, I've got these... This, this order, and this order has a bunch of order detail line items, I'm going to draw a circle around that, and I'm going to say that's an aggregate, and I'm going to in enforce some consistency on it. Uh, and then I just keep sta staging that up, right? I'm going to do the same thing with a bounded context, a little higher level. Um, and it's way more than you asked in your question, but hopefully that's helpful. So event storming all by itself, no, not, not by that name. Events as part of modeling a domain, definitely, yes. All right. This has zero references. This has one reference. Where are you being called? Services to add DB context in configure services. And when I run this thing, it's supposed to do. I guess it's not doing anything different. Hmm. I thought it had a configure production services and a configure development services, but I don't see that in here anymore. So I must be thinking of a different project. So when it does add to be context, all it ever does is add SMT or uh, SQLite, um, which means in here when I do it this other way, configure services, create service provider, add a DB context using in memory. thing in this in memory thing would override that. Like it used to. I'm not sure why it's not now. And it works fine in my machine. So why in Azure or GitHub would it suddenly decide it wants to use SQLite and blow up? All right, so that's all fine. says in release. Let's try that exact line. Because that might be important. Okay, here's exactly what they're running. Five minutes to go. Are we going to make it pass? Pa oh, look at that. We duplicated it. Awesome. Alright, so why in release mode do you decide that you're going to do SQLite? That's the question. Alright. What is different about release mode? Still running in debug. Okay, so here it's in custom web factory. Functional task, custom web line 52. I'm going to debug this in a second, probably. So ensure created is the problem. Uh, not populate test data. So when I try and ensure created, it's trying to talk to SQLite, and in release mode, it has issues. And maybe ensure created does different stuff based on what mode it's in. Ensure created release mode. Here's a thing on that. Hey, when I use uh, SQLite, I get this error. And release doesn't work for my unit tests. It sounds exactly like what I'm talking about. Um, mm -hmm. 
Looks like you're bringing in two versions of SQLite. And you guys punted on it. That's not helpful. Alright, well, that's exactly the problem I'm seeing. Um, something to do with indexes with the same name on different tables. I'm not using indexes. That shouldn't be my issue. Okay, cool. That's the same problem I'm getting. Caused by indexes. Ensure all objects' names are unique. Region was the name of the table, name and index. I don't think I have any indexes. So it's two different things that are saying indexes are the problem. Uh, let's get rid of that. Let's see. Database and shit. How would I? I'm not doing anything to configure indexes. I have literally one table, which is to do item. I think instead of using memory database, I can probably just use in memory SQLite. Maybe. Let's see what happens if I just do that. Is it an issue with the actual file or is it an issue with SQLite? Yeah, it blows up, but it doesn't tell me why. Just that there is a status fail. Alright. Let's flip this to release. And let's do our functional tests. That should give me the same error. If it wants to actually run. There we go. And this failed. Alright. At two oh two PM we start debugging. 
And with release build, it's going to be not good. Alright, well, let's see what we can do. Not much. Alright. But the bug only happens in release mode. That doesn't make our job easier. Um. So it comes into here. Something with the data access it doesn't like. Everything else is fired. I'm guessing that I didn't... Uh, well, 500 error is not good. It didn't just return an empty list. It blew up. But it won't tell me what it blew up as. for the follow Andrex if I got that right alright let's put this back the way it was let's go I don't want to share that because that's just going to cause people problems in memory DB testing should work This call right here must be getting back a SQLite instance instead of this in-memory database. So I feel like I need to clear out any existing FDB context here, which just doesn't feel right to me. I feel like I'm missing something in how this is set up. It's been a while since I messed with it. Um, let's go look for latest dependency injection. I think we'll try this. So I wrote this doc way back in the day, but it's been a while. And this was the basis for the code that I'm using now inside of Clean Architecture. Here, so this should look pretty similar, but they only call this once, and I'm calling it like twice, I think. And they do actually remove it manually. Alright, that's what I was about to try and do. So, okay. So let's steal this code. And in here, let's put these side by side. So that's what I was thinking I might have to do, but I didn't want to do it unless this thing was telling me it was the way to do it. So, builder, dot configure services, services, whatever. In here, remove the apps DB context, which is the one that's using SQLite. Pull in link, find anything that's an app DB context, and wipe it out. And then add an in memory database for testing. That's what I'm doing here. And I don't remember what this internal service provider did. I'm going to leave that out for now. Uh, build the service provider. I need that, so I'm going to take all this, get rid of it. I don't think I need that. Alright. But I think I do need all the rest of this. Let's see what else they're doing. Build the service provider, create a scope, mm -hmm. have the DB, we have a logger, call and share created. Populate the database, log any problems. All right, that looks good. So let's build that. And that's app DB context. Mm 
to build that again. So close. Almost done. Uh, let's do this one more time. And cross our fingers slash pray slash sacrifice a chicken. Yoohoo! Alright, we're good. Now we're gonna do a dot net. No, we need to get add dot get commit dash n fixed tests with in memory database versus SQLite. Get push. And we are gonna call it a day for the stream. Um, while I'm doing this, let's see what other live coders there are. I can't remember how to find them. Twitch.tv, WAC, Team, Live Coders. We have an alias for that, but. This is Sala Summer. Um, our good friend Clarkio is always on, or the. This is Sala Summers. Stop that. You're too loud. Mute. Um, Rhyme U8354, maybe? Stupid ads. Alright, um, don't need that anymore. Want to see if my pull request passes the build. We're gonna merge this pull request and I'm gonna raid somebody. So Clarky has got 55 people. He's a quite the popular guy. Uh, and then we got uh, Rhymeu8354 who's name I often forget because it's not in his alias anywhere. He's building a game. I'm gonna, we'll do Clarkio this time. I haven't done him in a while. So we're gonna go to twitch.tv with Clarkio and it's probably gonna show me yet another ad. Nope, nope, there he is. Alright, cool. And then I can go to my Twitch. Uh, there? Maybe? Alright, get ready to raid. Okay, look, the build succeeded. Sweet. And the, look at this, the GitHub one passed faster than the uh, Azure DevOps one. Um, which doesn't necessarily mean anything, but... Alright, this fixes... Amazing, I still remember this. 96 and 100. Two for one. Uh, squash and merge. Do it. Yes, do it. Alright. We got that finally fixed. We're gonna delete that branch and call it a day. So I'm gonna do a raid. We're gonna pick Clarkio. We're gonna start the raid. I'm gonna say, have a nice rest of your Friday and a good weekend. Stay safe during this uh, pandemic and raid now. <laughs>